September the 24th, 1945. When Lady Bradshaw summons you, you go. Mary and I were bound for our honeymoon, but the chance to dine with one of Britain's finest antiquarians was too great for us to miss. When we met, Bradshaw wore a brooch that caught Mary's eye. A Sumerian relic recovered from a dig site in the Hashemite Kingdom of Iraq. After dinner, she showed us another find from the same site, a gold cuneiform tablet. She called it the final puzzle piece in her life's work, a map that pinpoints the tomb of Alexander the Great. If she's right, the tomb lies somewhere on the border of Iraq. Lady Bradshaw wants us to lead her expedition. I realize now that our honeymoon will take place in a dusty dig site in the Zagros Mountains. April the 2nd, 1946. We have assembled our team. Top of my list was my old comrade from the wars, Captain Sherman Crow, the bulldog of Omaha Beach. We found him in Cairo, brawling for money in a Levantine drinking club. Crow recommended an experienced dig foreman, Arthur Pullman. And in Haifa, we picked up my assistant, the always inquisitive Aline Journeau. Lady Bradshaw insisted on the presence of her own advisor, Ellis van Hoyten, an archaeologist I know only from his poor reputation. Our team complete, we shall head to the Lebanon and from there by train to Baghdad. October the 21st, 1946. Crow was the first to break into the tomb, an honor he shared with Bessie, that damned machine gun of his. It was a beast of a weapon, but it seemed to comfort the fellaheen doing the digging. This place has lain undisturbed for centuries. It is not the tomb of Alexander the Great, but a temple of an even older god king, the Akkadian despot, Naram Sin. We have been mistaken, but Lady Bradshaw still declares it a find for the ages, a discovery that will write our names in the annals of history. Looking out at this sceptered hall, I have no reason to doubt her. The catacombs beneath the temple are heaped with human bones. Aline has worked sacrificial digs in El Castillo, but even she hasn't seen death on this scale before. The Acadians killed thousands in the name of their gods, most ritually decapitated, but others crudely slain and dumped in charnel pits, as though the slaughter had spiraled out of control. What plague or cataclysm demanded such a price? So much blood spilled. And for what? Whatever happened here a millennia ago, it is a secret waiting to be discovered. Our work begins in earnest. Seventh of December, 1946. Our finds have been so spectacular, I couldn't resist breaking out the champagne. As I entered the survey tent to pour a glass for Mary, I realized something was awry. She'd found Bradshaw's crate of dynamite. I tried to calm her, but she worked up a full head of steam, sounding off about the risks of what using the explosives at a dig site. Bring the down. She was right, of course. I feel terrible for hiding it from her. Just then, Crow arrived and picked up the dynamite. When Mary ordered him to put, to put it down, he looked her boldly in the eye and said they'd found something below. The bottom of the chasm stank of death and was littered with corpses, fresh enough to be covered in flies. Crow thinks that local bandits must have tossed their victims down here after robbing them. I pity those hapless wanderers the fear they must have felt as they tumbled to their doom. But this was not what he wanted to show us. 
an unearthly light pierced the rocks. When Mary asked us what it was, Bradshaw nodded to Crow, who broke open the dynamite. She said she intended to find out. Blowing a hole through the rock face, we found a gateway to a strange world below. A phosphorescence emanated from beneath, casting its eldritch light over us all. Lady Bradshaw was insistent that we descend further. Perhaps Mary is right, and Bradshaw is becoming reckless and uncontrollable. But I can't stop thinking about what's down there. I am now working with Crow and Pullman to set up a winch and elevator to descend into the shaft. What mysteries lie below, I wonder, undisturbed by the world above. Thirteenth of December. Crow, Bradshaw and I descended in the elevator. As we left, I was struck by the change in Bradshaw's temperament. She seemed eager, almost manic in the face of our new discovery. When we reached the bottom, Crow could not prevent himself from letting loose an oath. There before us, set in a dizzying vault, lay a city. It was loathsome, colossal, and sleeping. A great carcass built in some ancient age before men. Overcome with awe, I fell to my knees. Twenty-eighth of December. God forgive us. For days we have studied this dead, silent realm and its entombed abominations. Now the horrors have come for my own dear Mary. Crow found her unconscious in the star chamber, her notes scattered around her. He carried her back to our supply room and laid her down in one of the cells. When Bradshaw learned what had happened, she was evasive about Mary's work down there. As I cleaned my wife's face, she spoke to me in a fever, sounding distressed and confused. I have resolved to keep a vigil over her. I pray her fever abates so we can escape this cursed place. Ninth of December. Pullman says the radio has been sabotaged. An expert job with vital wires severed. Someone wants to cut us off from the outside world. Aline fought in the resistance, but while she is undoubtedly capable, I refuse to accept she's responsible. Personally, I still harbor doubts about Van Hoyt, although without proof, everyone remains a suspect. All I can do now is place sentries on the expedition's equipment. 30th of December. Mary's condition worsens. This evening, I awoke from an exhausted daze to find Lady Bradshaw asking my wife more of her damned questions. Mary was babbling something about winged demons. But this... Bradshaw's eyes lit up and she asked whether Mary could sense them now. Gripped by delirium, my wife lashed out, clawing at Bradshaw's chest. Lady Bradshaw withdrew, and I was, after a while, able to calm my wife. 31st of December. Mary is dead. I sat with her in her final moments, telling her how sorry I was. Sorry for accepting Bradshaw's offer, for ever coming to this hell-forsaken place, for placing my vanity above our love. When Mary spoke about the end of everything, 
I knew she sensed death coming. With her last words, she made me swear to bury this place. Nine p.m. Something unholy has happened. As I sat with my wife, I noticed something in her hand. Lady Bradshaw's brooch. She must have pulled it from her shirt when she grabbed at her. Turning it over, I noticed that it looked like one of the creatures we'd exhumed from the cocoons. Were these the demons Mary had spoken about? Had Bradshaw known all along what we'd find down here? Then Mary's corpse moved. It was not my wife. It was something inhuman. It leapt at me, and only the bars of the cell spared me from its fury. The camp is in uproar. Workers are missing, and Lady Bradshaw has returned to the city deep below. No one knows why, but I can guess. She yearns for the same fate that befell Mary. She wants to be one of them. First of January, 1947, 1 a.m. The saboteur has struck again, sealing us in here. We are hopelessly trapped with those things. All around us, they shriek from the darkness. Crow has set up his machine gun, pointed towards the catacombs. Mary was right. We cannot fight that which does not live. There is only one option now. Bring the whole damn temple down on them. Even if it means bringing it down on our own heads. They cannot be allowed out of here. When this temple falls, my wife and I will be buried together, side by side. I owe her that, at least. The portrait that I carry in my watch case is the Mary that I remember. Not that thing in the cell. This was all Lady Bradshaw's doing. She knew all along what was down here. She led us to them. I found her below hunched over the murdered corpse of Van Hoyten. As she turned to face me, I saw that she had changed. My hand fell to the closest weapon I could find, an iron tent peg. I stabbed her with the metal, impaling her in the heart. She died. Unholy screams echoed from deep below, as if answering the sudden release of blood. They are coming. We must end it here. With fire and gun smoke. If there is time, my last act will be to dictate this diary onto tape. Perhaps if it is found in the rubble, it can serve as a warning to any who follow us. The bones of this temple are drenched in blood. We have set foot on an uncharted shore and roused something ancient and wicked. A blasphemy that comes in indescribable shapes and forms. For eons we lived as children in this world, unaware of the horrors that slumber beneath our feet. Now we have blindly thrown open the gates to madness. I fear being taken, but I must do what I must. We must seal this place for eternity. For all mankind. Mary, I'm sorry.